Well, good morning. Wonderful to see you again. We are we're getting back into our series on the book of John. And I, I wanted to start by saying, you know, there's something kind of awesome about getting together and, and having a sort of a, a, a gathering of some sort, maybe a potluck or a party or family, family event. Actually, uh, not so long ago, we had a potluck here at the church with uh, some of the pastors and we had a, a Friday night get together. Oh, it was so good. One of the pastors, uh, he, his wife, she brought out uh, falafel. She made falafels. And I haven't had falafel since Israel. So it was like, oh my goodness, it was so great. It's great to get together and, and have time of fellowship and all that. There is a problem, though, when you get together like for a potluck and they run out of food. And I've been there where there was a potluck and, and nothing was left and you're sitting there going, oh, and it's embarrassing, right? Or, or, or when you get together and you have a fun time together and somebody gets out of hand and there is some words that are, are spoken that they wish they wouldn't have spoken, maybe it leads to some confrontation. I mean, I've seen it before and you have probably seen it as well on, on YouTube or wherever where, where, where teens are getting together and then there's, there's a fight that breaks out and then it just kind of leads to another thing, one thing to another, and it's not fun. So, so, so squabbles aren't, aren't all that fun. Fights aren't all that fun when it's supposed to be at a, a happy event. There was a squabble that happened or a, a fight that happened uh, quite a number of years ago and right in the middle of the squabble was none other, are you ready? than Jesus. And I want to talk about a feast fight that happened, not a fist fight, a feast fight that happened in John chapter 7. And we're going to take a look at, at uh, what brought about this squabble. L let me by start by saying what the feast was all about. So, so it was the actual, uh, they called it Sukkot, or, uh, or the, the Feast of Tabernacles, as you can see in this picture. It's a week-long celebration where the Jews remember the, the 40 years of wandering by living in temporary booths, as you can see. You can see in this picture that they set up. Now they've obviously uh, today they've they made them a little bit more elaborate. Like this picture is incredibly beautiful compared to what it once was. But what happened was it, it, at the end of the agricultural year, the Israelites they would celebrate their Thanksgiving, so to say, and and they would they would live in these in these booths. It would be a week long camping trip. Woohoo! I I think I sign me up for that. And 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 they would be there as a family and they would uh, they would enjoy joy just remembering and at uh, the temple there it was there was a a big deal that was set up at the temple there a large candlestick was set up that would remind the people of the pillar of fire that led the Israelites every single day the priests would carry water from the pool of Siloam and pour it out for on the golden vas vessel at the time reminding the Jews of the miraculous provision that God had for for his people. You know, I I I think it would have been a it should have been a happy time, but it actually led to some problems when Jesus was there. We're gonna look into that. Why don't we start with prayer? Father, I thank you that your word is active, it is alive, it is it is very, very relevant for us here even today. And even as we look at this this situation where Jesus was confronted in such a way. Lord, I pray, help us to understand how that applies to us and to live in a way that honors you. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So, so when we looked at the situation here or what, what happened, it really started with disbelief. It started with a rejection. So let's jump to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 1 says this. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews were waiting to take his life. Let's stop there. I mean, this is crazy. Absolutely crazy. If you jump back to chapter 6 of John, Jesus had fed the, the multitude. I mean, there could have been up to 20,000 people there that Jesus had fed. And then he me healed a man at this pool. Now, the, the picture that you see here, there's no water. And we went and visited the, the pool of Bethesda. But, but it was a massive area that, uh, that Jesus went into. And there was a man that had been lame 
laying in this area for 38 years. You should have been thrilled, or at least I would have been thrilled if I would have seen somebody that was healed from a disease after 38 years. But the leaders were far from thrilled. They were actually miffed. Why were they upset? Because someone dared to disrupt the Sabbath and their traditions. See, Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath day. And not only that, he also called God his own father, which made him equal to God. He dared to rock the boat at the time. He dared to do more than they could do. And they were jealous, they were angry, and they were out for blood. You ever been, uh, you ever been rejected? Have you ever had someone jealous about you? Have you ever been a place where someone wanted to hurt you? Can I just say, if that's you, if you've ever experienced that, and I, I bet you every one of you listening to me have experienced something like that, can I just say you are not alone? It, Disbelief. Jesus was rejected, but it didn't end there. It went from there to ridicule. Go to verse 2. He said, but when the Jewish feast of tabernacle was near, Jesus' brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Okay, let me, let me make something clear. Contrary to, to popular belief of some groups, Jesus did have siblings. Mary had other children. Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 to 56 says this. Isn't his mother Mary, talking about Jesus, isn't his mother Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, aren't all his sisters with us. So Jesus would have had half brothers. And you know, the thing is, if you would have been living in the house of Jesus, just kind of imagine this. I mean, it, would, it was a pretty large family. If you would have been living there, there probably would have been all sorts of squabbles. And then there's Jesus who never sinned. I mean, you would have figured they would have taken notice of this guy. But even though they saw him on an un ongoing basis, they still were unbelievers. They saw how everyone had rejected Jesus here as well. And basically, they're saying, hey, here's your chance, Jay. Why don't you, why don't you uh, 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 go to Jerusalem? There's going to be a pile of people over there and at the feast. Man, what a better platform for you. If you think you're such a, you know, you're, you're you're somewhere closer to God. Man, go show yourself to these people. And they're, um, they're almost taunting him at this time. See, it's crazy because uh, Satan offered the, uh, the Lord the same suggestion just a, a few years earlier than that. Jesus was told by Satan that, that uh, he could have all the prestige and all the stuff in the world if he only were to worship the, the Satan. Of course, we know that, uh, that he, uh, he wouldn't do that. See, Jesus was not interested in celebrity status. He was not interested in being somebody great and being in the middle of the great crowds and, and having people like ooh and awe ah after him. It's unfortunate that there are people in, in our world today that are very, very much interested in the celebrity status. I was talking to Pastor Charlie uh, our, our youth pastor, and he, uh, he was telling me about uh, his family back east, and, and they attend a church down in, in the southern, or sorry, the eastern states, and he says that, that the pastor, who calls himself the bishop, comes into the church in, uh, when, during the service with armed bodyguards walking him up to the stage. Go figure. And uh, uh, they, he told me that, that the church um, heard that the pastor had a need of a, of, of, of a new golf cart because, you know, it's going to be tough for this guy to get around. So the church said, let's buy the pastor a new golf cart. The, 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 the pastor said, hey, I'm going on vacation, and, and obviously I need some money for vacation. So they took up a collection for the pastor, and they, they 
pulled together $20,000 for him to go on vacation. The pastor needed a, a, a better, a better uh, a jet, so they pulled money together for that. Man, I live it. I, I, have, I wouldn't even ask the church for a tank of gas. But here is a guy who has this prestige, who has this celebrity mentality. See, it's not just about a person that is in, in, in a pulpit or in other offices. Beware, even for yourself, that you don't begin to, to lift yourself up at the expense of others. It's important that we understand that, uh, that we need to remain humble. And Jesus was that. Now, see, it's interesting that Jesus spent only two days with large crowds, mentioned here in chapter 6, but he spent six months with his 12 disciples. In other words, he saw the importance of investing and individuals and being in, in, in a humble situation, how important that is. And we need to have that same mentality. Let's go back to, uh, to John chapter 7. It says, the right time for me has not yet come, Jesus says. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what is done is evil. You go to the feast. I am not yet ready to go up to this feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Having said that, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went uh, also, not publicly, but in secret. It was not the right time for Jesus to show himself. He was not interested in, in, uh, in appeasing individuals. He was not going to be allowed the ridicule of his brothers to push him to do something. And can I encourage you, just because somebody ridicules you, just because somebody pushes you in a certain direction, don't, don't, don't bite. Don't bite. Don't go into it. Be willing to to seek some time with the Lord and say, God, what do you want from me? Well, it started with disbelief for Jesus, this feast fight, and then it led to a debate. And let's talk about the opposition. Go back to uh, John 7. We're looking at verse 11. It says, now the feast of the Jews, or sorry, now at the feast of the Jews, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowd, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. So there's three people here, or three groups, Groups of people here um, in this debate arena. There is the leaders who lived in, in Jerusalem and were attached to the temple ministry. These guys were all about the temple. They wanted to preserve, preserve their culture, preserve their traditions. And these guys were seeing that Jesus was rocking the boat and they didn't like it and they wanted him dead. There was a crowd who had come to the festival. They're hoping to see the good man. They've heard things about this guy named Jesus. Hey, maybe if he shows up, maybe he'll do some fancy miracle for us. Hey, we could use a, a new lunch. Maybe he'll give Give us uh, uh, some some more bread, or like he did for the feeding of the. Uh well, 20,000. Uh, and maybe he can do something great for us. And then there was maybe what we could call the Jerusalemites. They were standing with the leaders because, of course, you don't want to rock the boat and you want to be chum up with your leaders. So these guys are kind of the followers. I'm thinking if I've been um, hunted by the law, I'm thinking that that the average citizen is is uh, of the city is thinking it's a good idea that that I that uh, I, I be avoided. I'm thinking that if if there are people out to get me, I probably wouldn't have stepped into this citizen this situation. I probably would have kept my distance and. Uh, and like Jesus said at the beginning, not go right up, I probably wouldn't have gone up at all. And see, here's the problem. I think the problem with many of, our, of us as believers is we don't go up at all. We don't go into a place of, of possible confrontation or opposition. We are very careful not to do anything, again, that would rock the boat. And you know what we do many times is we just keep our mouths shut when really 
we should be more vocal, not in a way that's condescending, not in a way that, that uh, belittles other people, but certainly in a way that makes truth known. What would happen, listen, what would happen if the Canadian Christian would stand for the right to life in our country, where there are absolutely no laws that govern abortion? What would happen if Christians would say, we w want to see children preserved instead of allowing, uh, as in 2021, Statistics Canada says that 87,485 children were killed in that year because of abortion, and the church has remained quiet. What would happen if the church would begin to stand up and say, we honor life at all stages, if it is from the infant all the way to someone that is old and, and feels that they, the best way to, to go is to take their life and be euthanized. What would happen if we were to take a bit of a stand? Unfortunately, we keep our mouth shut. And Satan loves it, man. He loves it. Because if we keep our mouth shut, he can take more territory and more territory and more territory. And this is what has happened in, in our world. It doesn't mean we have to be belligerent. Please hear me. I am against us going out there and, and causing a huge disruption. But I'm also against us not doing anything. And that first of all, for sure praying, but then being vocal, saying we stand for life. You know, I have a pastor friend who, who he is uh, in our general area here. And he stood up and, and he spoke about the, the fact that he stands for for marriage, for man and woman to be married. And, and because of his stand, he actually had the LGBTQ come to his, his uh, front yard and protest. And uh, so what did he do? <laughs> I love what he did. He actually went out, sat down with them, and just had dialogue and just talk to them, showing them that I, I don't hate you. I'm not against you as individuals. I am for a marriage between a man and a woman. See, folks, I think we need to be known what we are for and take a stand where we need to take a stand. And certainly that brings us to the next point here where, where Jesus wasn't afraid of opposition. He was willing to take a stand. It says in verse 14, um, uh, halfway through the feast, or not until halfway through the feast, did Jesus go up to the temple courts and began to teach. Do, do you get that? He's right in the open speaking truth, though they wanted him dead. It's interesting their response. Verse 15, the Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without studying? He, they were amazed that he taught and he, ha, he did not have the credentials or, or he was not approved by, by, by the Jewish people. He, he wasn't in some big uh, uh, a school and, and, and gone through all this stuff. And they looked at him and said, there's something about him because he taught with authority. Someone said, Jesus taught with authority while the scribes and Pharisees taught from authority, quoting all the famous rabbis. See, when God... God comes upon us, when God comes and we ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, he gives us the authority to speak truth in a way that is, that is clear, but in a way that is also not condescending once again. Verse 16, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. You know, folks, maybe it's time again. As I said last week, maybe it's time again. We, we get on our knees and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I would be able to speak truth. And I would be able to speak in a way that, I, that would honor you. The Holy Spirit was given to fill us with power to stand in the midst of opposition. I was reading a, a book, and I, I actually encourage you to read one. this one. It's called The Watchmaker's Daughter. It's the story of Corey Ten Boom. And, and I, I don't know if you know the whole story, but Corey was, uh, was taken into, into prison in World War II, into a, a Nazi prison ca camp. And she, uh, while she was going to be in, uh, incarcerated, she was brought before a judge. And the judge was actually had, was given the authority to either 
have a person released or have a person committed and possibly killed. And it's interesting when she was brought before this judge, her thoughts were not so much on her safety. Her thoughts were more so on, on, on how can I be an encouragement to this guy? And she began to share the message of hope and the message of salvation. She began to witness to this guy who could probably have sent her to her death. I wonder if we cower when opportunities arise and God wants us and challenges us to shine and to speak forth the truth of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit so we can stand at those times. Verse 18 says, He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor from himself, but he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Let's be people that are men of truth as Jesus said. Said. Let's be people that give forth the message of hope. Jesus did, and he was willing to speak the truth, and they answered in a pretty derogatory way. Verse 20 says, you are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus had, had, had violated the Sabbath, then he had claimed to be God, and now they wanted to be him dead. And above all that, they, they called him demon-possessed because he was saying, hey guys, I'm telling you the truth. You want me dead. And instead of acknowledging the fact that hey, maybe you're right and acknowledging the fact that uh, maybe there's things we need to change, they in turn, they in turn, turn uh, took a, a, an awful, awful stand of condemning him and saying he's possessed by a demon. It doesn't mean that when you take a stand, it's always going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you're going to have people raw rawing you. You may get some derogatory words thrown at you as well. But Jesus didn't allow that to stop him because he knew the truth. Camp comes to the third part, the challenge. Verse 24, it says, Jesus says, Stop judging by mere appearance and make a right judgment. See, the crowds were making a judgment call on Jesus by what they thought they saw and what they knew of him. But there was so, so much more of Jesus. If they only would have taken time with him, if they only would have listened and observed and put their own prejudice aside, what a difference it would have made. Sometimes, see, what happens for us is, is that we, we are, are, are consumed by what we think or what we see. And, you know, what happens is that we, we see somebody coming to us and we see somebody from a distance and we kind of, I don't know if we want to spend time with them. And we really don't get to know the individual. I got to tell you, I'm a little bit of a MASH fan. I know some of you are now turning off your TV and going, ah, I can't believe the guy likes MASH. Well, okay, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a MASH fan. And uh, uh, one of the episodes in MASH is, is an interesting story. It's based on, on, on a true story, actually, this episode, about a, a guy that finds himself in the MASH unit. MASH, of course, is a mobile hospital in the Korean War. And he, he finds himself in, in this hospital due to something. And, and he is actually a bomber. And he would fly over North Korea, and he would drop bombs uh, from a very high altitude. And when he found himself in this, uh, in this hospital, he came face to face with some of the Koreans that were hurt because of bombings like the ones that he dropped. And as soon as he began to put a face to the individuals, instead of just seeing it from a, a distance of 30,000 or whatever feet, he, his attitude changes. Change. See, sometimes we got to put our face to the situation. We got to get up close and personal. We got to understand who the people are and, and we got to stop judging by mere appearance, as Jesus said, and make a right judgment. These guys, they looked at Jesus and said, man, he, he can't be the Messiah. He can't be uh, who he says he, he is because nobody knows where Christ comes from, they, they were saying. Number two, he says, they, they thought that we know where Jesus is of Nazareth comes from. So number three, their conclusion was that he cannot be the Messiah. So Jesus uh, 
it says something very interesting here in verse 28. Verse 28 says, when Jesus still teaching in the temple courts, he cried out and said, yes, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not from I'm here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I know uh, I am from him and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not come. Still many of the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? Basically, Jesus was saying to them, okay, so you, so you say that you know that where I come from, do you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. I don't think you really know. I don't think you've given this much thought. Yeah, I mean, you may think I come from Nazareth, but why don't you take a look and see where I really do come from? And, and it's not even where I come from, from Bethlehem, but I'm coming from my father. And, and because they wouldn't accept it, as we see here, they tried to kill him or they wanted him dead. I, I, it's very unfortunate that uh, uh, people, people, again, make assumptions, and so even some religious people, people with, within the very circle of your, or, uh, of your church, may not get you. They may tell you, hey, listen, tone it down. You're getting too excited. Hey, listen, if God has called you to do, do something, uh, uh, just do it, regardless of what other people are saying to you. As Christians, let us live according to what God wants from us. And let us understand that God is there to help us to be the best we possibly can be. And we don't have to fear what people say about about us or might people say they may do to us as they said here to Jesus. Again, going to the, the book that I, I'm reading by Corrie Ten Boom, uh, she was uh, she was now find, found herself in a concentration camp and she had a little Bible, which was highly illegal to have in this camp. And uh, every single person in the lineup was being frisked and she was hiding this Bible inside her dress. And uh, she knew that if she was frisked, no, not only would they steal her Bible, they would probably beat her severely. And she says, Lord, I, I, I just need your word. I just want to keep your word close to my heart. Please don't let them take my Bible. And she says, as she's walking down the line, the, the woman in front was highly frisked all over the place. And then she walked up to the line and they didn't even look at her. They'd let her walk right through. And the person behind her was highly frisked as well. The point is God can take care of you. He can take care of you if you trust him. And, uh, but the, here in this portion of the scripture, the debate went on. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowds whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I will go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. See, the, the, the religious leaders were incredibly angry. They said, we've had enough. They sent out these guards. They sent out the, 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 the hit squad and grab them. Let's take them back. Let's take them out. Let's be done with this guy. And, and Jesus says, listen, I want you to understand something. He says, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving in a very, very short time. Within six months, Jesus would be in heaven within six months of this time. And he says, look, if you don't make some right decisions now, you won't follow me. He says to the crowds, look, look, make sure you're understanding what I'm saying to you. But see, unfortunately, many of the crowd refuse to believe in Jesus. Can I challenge you here today? Can I challenge you with this, that you have a choice what you do with the message of Jesus. You can either accept it or you can, you can butcher it and reject it. It's really up to you. But the truth that Jesus said here to these people is truth for us today, that, that he is going to a place and unless you accept him, you will not be with him. It's 
Serious stuff here, folks. Very serious, and I encourage you to examine where you are at with this. So there, there, there was a rejection here, and it led to division. And here we start with an announcement that was made. Verse 37. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit. Through, uh, who, who's, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On the last day of the feast, this, this is day seven. This was a very special time for the, the Jewish people. What would happen was the priest would march around the altar seven times, chanting Psalm 118, verse 25, which says, O Lord, save us, O Lord, grant us success. He would then pour water onto the altar, which was symbolic of Moses when he actually struck the rock. You remember? He struck the rock and water poured out of it. Actually, we saw this place. They say that, that this picture here is called uh, Moses' Spring. It's by Mount Nebo. And th there's a big tree, as you can see in this picture, that, that grew up there and water comes out of that area. Uh, a spring rises out of that area and just and floods the, the, the area around it. And it's interesting. It's an interesting Interesting fact that if if you were to go to Mount Nebo where we were at and you were to stand on Mount Nebo where Moses was taken up to heaven you would look to one side and you would see the promised land and you look down below and you would see that place where the, Moses struck the rock. It's an interesting, interesting uh, picture for Moses at the time. Uh, seeing the place where he struck the rock where God told him not to. Seeing the promised land where, uh, where he was wanted to go, but he was caught between the two places. It's a great sermon. I'll have to preach that one another time. But anyways, what happened here is, is that, that on this last day, there is a, it's a, the remembering all the things that happened. And then Jesus stood up. I love that. Jesus stood up and he says that, that wonderful verse. He says, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It, 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 he was saying, listen, I want to give you the Holy Spirit. I want to empower you. I want to flood you, not just with a, with a little bit of water, which we all need for refreshment, but I want to flood you with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit, he brings us refreshment. He purifies us as water does. Us. He brings us, he brings us that, 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 that life that water brings to, to plants and so forth. At this feast, where they were reenacting a tradition that could never satisfy the heart, Jesus offered them something so much better. He offered him himself. You know, I, I, I was watching The Chosen with Michelle, and I was watching the episode where, uh, where Jesus meets the woman at the well, and, and they did such a great job of this, where, where the woman, she, she looks at him, and, and she is, she's kind of like, uh, I'm not really sure, she's highly suspicious, as you can see in this picture, and then, and then he reveals himself to her, and she turns from being highly suspicious to absolutely overwhelming filled with joy because Jesus gave her something beyond the water from the well. He gave of himself. People need it. People need Jesus. They need that refreshment. They need him. But, but you know, and, and you think about it, back then they, they, they needed him as well, but they didn't accept. It led to a debate. And the debate here starts in verse 40. On hearing that his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Now, they were thinking back to what, what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, that a prophet would rise up that would, be, would come after Moses and that would actually be greater than Moses. This prophet would not bring about some frightening manifestations of fire and, and booming voices. Like, like happened during the time of the Israelite wandering. No, no, this prophet would be a fellow countryman. He would be familiar to the people and one uh, that would be on their own level. So, so some regarded Jesus that maybe, maybe he's this prophet. Some thought, well, maybe he is the Messiah that was being pro promised to us. They saw him uh, in, uh, as, as possibly somebody great. 
So others said, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem? And so there was this debate. Some people were saying a prophet, some were saying Messiah, some were saying, I don't think so. And there's this, this kind of uh, debate going on. And, uh, uh, you know, can I tell you, uh, when you think about it in our, in our setting, uh, Christianity can be, stand up under scrutiny. Christianity can stand up when people debate. It doesn't matter what people think. And I, I, I actually encourage people when they are looking at faith and when they're looking at Christianity, I, I say to them, hey, hey, listen, check it out. Check it out. Why don't you do some research and take some time to, uh, to find out if it's real or not? I, I encourage people to read the book Case for Christ or at least watch the movie. And see, there was a debate here. Unfortunately, the debate led to rejection. Verse 45 says, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him to in? And they said, No one has spoken the way this man does. Verse 47 says, You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob who knows nothing of the law, there, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who, by the way, uh, was one of these Pharisees who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their number, the scripture says, and, um, asked, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come from Galilee. It's interesting, the temple guards, like these are the, uh, the, the muscle, okay, that maybe don't have all the brains and all the learning that, that the, all these other religious leaders have. They, they saw Jesus and they were moved because they were really thinking and listening. A, a Nicodemus, Nicodemus who, who himself was a learned man, was willing to open up his mind and listen to Jesus as we read in John chapter 3. They were willing to hear him out. God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak to you and encourage you to not be led astray by the crowds, to not be led astray by, by, by popular thinking and so forth, but to hear his message and to listen clearly. Listen, it is not an, a popular message, the message of Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 said, says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is a gate, and broad is a way, road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus was saying it's not a popular, popular uh, place to go. A beautiful picture, by the way, here, um, a German, German uh, picture of the narrow and the wide gate. But, but the, the point here is that, 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 that it's not going to be popular to go through the narrow way. It's not going to be popular to stand against the crowd. See, the, the, as John MacArthur says in one of his commentaries, the, the road is broad, that, that is broad, is easy, it's attractive, it's inclusive, it's indulgent. And it's permissive and self-orientated to the way of the world. There are few rules, there are few restrictions and few requirements. All that you, you need to do is, is just profess Jesus. And see, even in the Christian realm, it, 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 some people say that, you know what, just say yes to Jesus and you can just go on with life. But God is calling you to a higher calling. And it may lead to some debates. It may lead it will lead to opposition, but in the end, it will lead to being with Jesus. Jesus had a confrontation at the one place that should have been happy. And you and I, we may have our confrontations, but can I encourage you, never give up on what God has for you. Stand strong. Keep your faith in Christ. Remember, He will help you through. In the end, He will bring you to His glorious home. Father, I thank you for your word here today. I thank you that in the midst of all the opposition that Jesus faced, that he still stood strong. 
for what was truth. Help us to do the same, God. Help us not to be swayed by popular opinion or, or what people around us want us to do or believe, but to stand upon your word and to keep your word central to all that we are. So Father, bless those that are listening to me here today. Help us all to continue to serve you faithfully, to be a blessing to you and God to make a difference in the world around us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you so much for joining me here this morning. I wish you God's very, very best as we continue to serve him. Let us be salt and light in the community God has called us to be in. God bless you.